All right, welcome everybody to C++11 concurrency. How many people here have done Threads programming in the past? All right, so I see why you're interested in being here. Um, yeah, I, I started with the Threads library and then started with the Threads library. And if you use either of those, none of these concepts are going to be foreign. There are a couple nice things that C++11 adds, like futures, but a lot of the core technology is still the same from any other concurrent code that you've written. Um, this talk, we're going to cover two different aspects of the C++11 support for concurrency. We're going to talk about some of the high-level components for creating and managing threads. And then we're going to talk about some of the low-level lock-based components for making thread-safe data structures. Um, the best thing I think about these uh, threads compared to others is that it's a standard. Um, so a lot of this technology, and none of this is going to be brand new to you, I don't think, but now you can write more portable code and have common facilities instead of having to worry about, well, I mean, you had Boost that allowed you not to have to worry about Windows threading versus P threading. But if you didn't have Boost, now you're going to be able to have a compelling argument for a common threading platform. So let's look at the high-level components. The main one that you'll be using to start out with is std thread. So here's a little example program in C++11. You can see I use this fancy direct initialization syntax to set up the, the map. And we're just mapping English words to French words. And what we want is we want to print out hello world in French. So we're going to let the computer do the conversion for us. So I have my dictionary. And I'm going to look up the greeting for the word hello. So I get bonjour into my greet string. And then I am going to create a thread to send that string out to the screen. Now, this is just a toy program. But imagine that this thread had to do a lot of work. This was expensive I.O. Um, while it's doing that, I can be doing the lookup for the next word. And then when I've got the, word, the next word for the world, I want to serialize the output. I want hello to come before goodbye. So I have to join with the thread that I had started up above. And they're both green to show you that the thread is still running up there. So now he has completed, and I can output the word for world. And that's, that's just a very simple program to use threading, very similar to what you might write with Boost Thread. Now let's uh, change it up a little bit. We can, instead of using a uh, lambda that takes no arguments, we can pass in, I mean a lambda that captures, we can pass in a capture specifically with the bind protocol using std rep to, to pass in the reference to the greet variable. So this is the, uh, the header declaration for std thread. All of this stuff here has to do with the movability of threads. So we're just going to, when this kind of um, idiom appears in the headers, I'm just going to omit it. And we're going to just call it move only up here. So you're going to see in several of the different objects that I present to you, some are move only, some are copyable. And that's how I'm going to indicate it, rather than showing you all those methods. So what you're not seeing here, and what I'm not going to be talking about today, are thread priorities, or scheduling control, or other OS-specific things. There is, in that, in that header declaration, a native handle method that you can use to get a native handle type, which is undefined, that's platform specific. And then your platform will define what you can do with that native handle to do custom things that aren't covered by the standard. So that, that's your way to get to, to the underlying representation. <coughs> so now, what does it mean for a thread to be joinable? So a joinable thread is one that has a non-default ID, meaning it has been started. Uh, you can think of a joinable thread as an alive thread, or a thread that has some viable state that you can inspect. A thread has to be joinable in order for you to join it, or for you to detach it. So when you join it, you're going to be saying, I want to wait until you complete. And if you detach it, you're saying, I don't care when you complete. You go off and finish whatever you're going to be doing off on the side in your asynchronous world. My code's just going to go, and go on and continue. The thread cannot be joinable when it's been destroyed or if it's been moved aside. Uh, and I, go ahead. Uh, back in that header here, see that there is a, well, we don't see it yet. There, there's a method that we can call to find out if the thing is joinable. Now, if you do something on a, on a thread that's not joinable, what you'll get is a termination. So your program will just work. 
so we now have exceptions in threading. Threading operations, as it says here, throw system error. You may get a, an exception right away when you launch the thread. If there's no resources available, you may run onto this on some sort of mobile or embedded platform. And detach and join will throw if your thread is not joinable. Or if a thread lock can be detected. Now there are pretty limited uh, circumstances in which thread lock detection can occur. Uh, one would be that if you try to join yourself. The, the standard provides for that being detected as a thread lock. Your thread functions may not leak exceptions, otherwise you are going to terminate as well. So if your thread, you have to catch all of your exceptions or you have to accept that your code's going to abort if an exception gets out of your thread. So go back to our Hello World program. And now I'm making it a little more safe, uh, preventing the termination here, <coughs> the thread that I'm in. And what I do is if I have an exception there, trying to get the world method, if it's not in that dictionary, I'm just going to join my thread and get out. Just a way of letting my asynchronous execution complete before I decide that I'm going to pass the exception up. Uh, I, <laughs> Dave wrote that in there, but I forgot to ask him what he meant about that. There was some little thing he wanted, some little snafu he wanted to tell you about there. Um, this thread, similar to boost this thread, is a namespace that gets you access to thread details of the current thread. Now this pattern here that you see where you can say, I want my current thread to sleep until a certain time point from the chrono library, or I want it to sleep for a certain duration, this pattern repeats. It occurs in many places in the threading library. Anywhere where you would have to decide between I'm going to block, I'm not going to block, or I'm going to block for a specific amount of time. You're going to get methods like this that take these exact data structures. So instead of mention, giving you all that boilerplate every time, we'll just abbreviate it and say sleep until and sleep for. <coughs> and that's thread. Now, std async gives you a slightly easier way to launch thread. Yes? Uh, sure. On um, sleep, do you know why they didn't just overload on time point versus duration since they're different types? Did they just want to be really, really explicit about absolute versus relative? You know, I have never got sat in the concurrency <laughs> meetings. I'm more of an extens extensions guy, so I can't I'm wondering say. if this came from a boost thread. I'm seeing a boost thread is overloaded. Oh, they overloaded. Yeah, so they overloaded. Oh, okay. I see the first time. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me that the committee would want to make it more explicit. It seems reasonable. I just want to. Yeah. All right. So stood async. Here's my example where I was. This is the example we left with before, where we have the thread, and then I want to get the next, the next um, member here. And then I want to join if there's any type of problem with that and then throw back out. So I'm going to give my thread a chance to continue executing before I leave. What I can do is I can simplify this yeah. by using async. So I look up my greeting as I did before. And now std async just goes ahead and launches off that lambda. But if there's a problem, it's going to do, do that cleanup for me. It's going to do that join for me. as the, as the Thread, thread leads. So now the return value from this, I had auto there. What it really is, is it's a future. Now what a future says is, in this case it's not a very valuable future because it's going to be returning void, but it allows me to wait upon the result of an asynchronous execution. So I, I, set, I create this async, which is going to start executing right away in the default um, configuration, and I get back an object, and if I ask that object for what its value is, then it will wait at that time for the value to be provided by the asynchronous execution. If the asynchronous execution encountered an exception, I will get the exception when I inspect the future. So when I used thread and I started off the asynchronous execution, if that thread had caused an exception, I would have had terminate, like I mentioned before. But with async, the future will contain the exception. So I can move where the exception detection occurs. So now I can call get on the future to retrieve the void value, which I, which I don't use, or it will rethrow the exception that occurred in the asynchronous execution. Now, future is nice not just for asynchronous executions, because I can use that to delay execution as well. Async doesn't always have to be asynchronous. Async gives a interface for possible asynchronous. And I'll, and I'll show you what, how, you, how you change that through the arguments to it. So here's, the, here's another future. Getting the future and sending it 
straight to cutout. This time, this time I'm getting a string because I'm returning from my asynchronous execution. So I'm going to put the string into the future, and then when I call read.get down at the bottom here, I'm going to wait until that string is ready. So this is an easier way to write the very first example I showed you. I get serial output, but asynchronous execution. So async is, dr is driven by a launch policy. You can either have an async launch policy, in which case the execution is asynchronous and occurs in the thread, or you can have a deferred launch policy, which means wait until someone asks for the value of the future, and only then do you execute what I provided you in the async. You can also mix the two, which is the default, which is async or deferred, which means Make this async run asynchronously if, for example, there's a core idle on my machine. If I have an eight core machine, I can start eight asyncs asynchronously, and when I try to start the, the, the ninth one, it will be deferred until one of those cores frees up. So it's, it's a handy mechanism for just doing job queue. Um, he has a note here that GCC's live C++ treats it like deferred. Uh, I assume that that's something they need. I haven't been testing with GCC. So here's an example of using the launch policies to do a parallel merge sort. So I do the basic part of the merge sort up in the front. I find the distance between the beginning and the end. Um, if there is no distance, then I re return. I don't need to compute this, this branch. Otherwise, I get the iterator for the middle. And then I want to start an asynchronous execution <coughs> that splits the computation between the two sides. But I want to make it be synchronous if the distance is a relatively small value. I don't want to try and make everything asynchronous. I mean, that may not, may not be valuable. So I have a cutoff. If, it, if, either, if the distance between the two is less than 768 elements, go ahead and be synchronous, because that may be faster than trying to be threaded. Otherwise, use the deferred or async policy, which says use as many cores as you can. Be as threaded as possible, but don't go overboard. Don't use too many threads. And then down here, I access the future that came back from this async, and I, I wait at that point, and then I merge the results. So here's the uh, declaration for future. You can ask whether a future is valid or not, which means that you can get a value from it. If it's not valid, if you call get, there will be bad things will happen. Once you call get, you can't call get again. It's a one-shot deal. You can wait for the future to become valid. So that's similar to just, if you wait and then get, that's just the same as calling get. But if you need to wait on behalf of somebody further down the line who's going to call get, you can do that without getting that value that they can't now get because it's a one shot deal. We have that same pattern of the wait for and wait until. And then we have this method called share down here. And share returns a shared future, which is multi-shot. And it upgrades that future. It doesn't return you a copied object with, a, with another value in it. It actually changes this future to a shared future. And the future status is one of either ready, timeout, or deferred. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so a shared future is similar to a future. It's just that you can call it get many times, and it's copyable. The, the future is move only. But shared futures are copyable, so you can pass them around. <coughs> everybody can call get on them. And it's the first one who calls get is going to wait on it. And then everybody else can just access that value. It's going to hold the value. Wait. And you can turn any future into a shared future either by calling its share method or by passing the future to shared. Question. Yes. Uh, can you? You can call get as many times, but on a single shared future instance, can you re can you call get many times or yes. get one? No, many get times, the, okay. The, um, I'm a little with that. Skip. Down here, it's 
say, oh, this is the future image. All right, so get is multi-shot afterwards. So it doesn't go invalid by calling it get. OK. Yes? And if it would throw an exception? You would get that exception at the time you call it get. First time or every time? I would imagine it would be every time. I have not tried that. But it's, it's preserving a state which is repeatable. Huh. Now futures, we've been looking at futures that got created that you're now accessing. You can create futures yourself. You can create an object which you hand to somebody that they see as a future. So their side of it, the future side, they're getting. So you need something to put a value into, and that's called a promise. Promises are the other half of the future equation. So when I create a promise, I'm basically creating a one item deep queue that I can talk to other threads with. And I put an item in there, and somebody who gets the future from that promise can get off of that future and get the value that I put in there. So here's a simple little stupid uh, pushy, pushy example where I, I create a promise, which is my pushing interface. And I start an asynchronous thread, well, potentially asynchronous, right? Who knows how many other ones? Oh, this is in main, so yes, this is going to be asynchronous. And this receives, this asynchronous execution is going to receive a future. And in its method, it's going to call get. So that waits until somebody's going to put a value into that promise. And here, down here, is where I call get future to get the future out of the promise. <coughs> And so now these two are linked. The asynchronous side has the future, and I have the promise. And then all I have to call is set value to put a value into that promise. And now it depends on which one of us was faster. Maybe the async thread was faster, and it's been blocking, waiting on the get. The moment I set the value on the promise, it's going to unblock and get that value. Or if I were access, if I were going sooner, then I would call to get the set value and just move on. And then when he gets to the point where he needs the future future variable he would access it. And then I wait um, at the end there for that kind of thing. That gives you an easy way to produce features. So here's the header declaration for promise. We basically, when we create this, it's going to allocate memory <coughs> for the thing that we want to put into it. And you can pass in a different allocator to have that shared state go somewhere, be somewhere else. The get future method gets you the full interface, and this is one shot also. And then I have a set value, or I can call set exception. So I also can set an exception condition that when the person gets off of the future, they will see an exception. And it uses this exception pointer class, which I'm going to get to in a moment. And I can also set a value at thread exit. So what this does is it puts a result into the promise, but it defers the readiness of the future until the time that my thread is going to be ending. So I may, somebody may, be, may have the future from my promise, and they've called get, and they're waiting on it. And I know at the point in my code when I have the value that they're waiting on, but I don't want their execution to resume at that moment. So what I can do is I can set value at thread exit, and then the value will sort of, the, the, the future will not be valid my thread is ending. And I can also set exceptional threads. So any questions on that? Okay, exception pointer. Exception pointer is a nullable pointer. So it's a valuable, a value constructible from a null pointer. And you can from it you can get a copy of the currently handled exception. So if I have an exception <coughs> pointer, I can ask for an exception pointer from it. I can also cause it to be thrown with rethrow exception. <coughs> and I can make an exception pointer out of an exception. Out of any exception type. All right, this is about deferred launch. So typically, the async starts right away. But what if I don't want that? What if I want to set up the conditions for the asynchronous execution, but I don't want to start it yet? Whatever it is. What I can do is use something called a packaged task. So what a package task does is it's just like creating an async, except now I have to ask for the future. I don't get it as a return value from the call to async. I call get future on this package task that I created, 
and I now have it in my greet, and then I call it as a function to, to launch the package task. And where would this be useful? This would be useful if you wanted to create a whole bunch of jobs. Like say you were making a rendering queue, and you didn't want the rendering queue to start until the person had pressed, okay, I'm ready for it all to begin now. So you could create a big, deep queue of these package tasks, and then when the person presses the button, you just rip through and execute them. And now I have the futures for the values on them and the various threads that need those values to work, will be waiting on them. So this is an example where I add it to the task queue, to some task queue. And again, I'm using std move here because these things are not, uh, they're not complicated, but they are moved. <coughs> so here's the threader, the header for the task. So I store it, it stores some state, so it has an allocator um, version as well. And it takes a function object, an R value reference to some, some callable function object. And then it has a get future method, so I can get the pull interface off of it. It also has a valid, which says, is there, is there any state in here that, that's worth, worth getting? And then I have a function call to start it off. And again, I have the ability to only make it ready at thread exit. So I may put this in the <coughs> thread, the task queue, but I don't want it to even be startable until my thread is ended. So that way I can make it ready at thread exit. And then reset allows me to allocate new shared state for a package task so that somebody else can get another future. And what this means is package tasks are, re you can reuse them. So if you set up a package task, you put it in some queue, somebody's run it, Somebody's gotten the value out of the future, and you say, well, I want now the same thing to happen again. Because they clicked some button in their UI that's going to cause the exact same operation to occur. Instead of having to produce a new package task, you can just use the same object that you created before. It'll just allocate new shared state so that another future can be gotten from it. All right, that's all the high-level objects. There's not too many of them. I have a question about package task. Yes. Um, so it's sort of like a delayed spin async. Does it always behave as launch async, or essentially spins up the thread? There's no way to say, yeah, I want all the package tasks to start, but don't saturate all my cores. There's no way to reflect that. You know, it didn't show in that header declaration whether it took the launch policies. So I would have to I look that up. I haven't seen anyone about this today, so I was wondering if it was somewhere I could see. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know enough to answer that question. I haven't, I haven't yet been fortunate enough to use these facilities. I have, I have some boost thread code that I would, I'm eager to convert over to them. Um, so lock space. Yes, go ahead. Um, does thread or async work for uh, classroom function? Anything callable. Yeah. If you're going to do it with a member function, then you have to be concerned with that, sure. number, that method, that object like that. Well, it's, uh, if you say ampersand, you know, class and double column blah, that's not callable with pointer syntax. So there you're going to use std mem Yeah, you have, to, you have to bind it somehow to the best point. It has to be callable like a functor at least. Yeah. Yeah, plus boundary yeah. not. Yeah. But if the first parameter is this, uh, if the first parameter is the object, it's okay. Is it this? But at least you have to wrap your memory but then you can give the std thread the object to invoke it out. It's just you can't give a member function pointer to yeah. I mean, anything that would accept a function object of the call type will these will accept as well. Okay, so lock-based data sharing. Um, this is going to be a little bit of review for all you threading people, but the problem here is shared mutable state. So our examples up to this point have been completely functional. So I, I just want you to compute something and get back to me with the result. Um, our our I.O. examples were not purely functional because they were mutating, but they mutated the outside world. They did not mutate our, our, uh, any of the code we were working with. Um, like it says there, they were operating on I.O. streams which are already thread safe. So if you can avoid mutable data, of course, as you know, threading becomes much simpler, but if you can't, you're going to have to have some way of doing synchronization. So um, synchronization solves the problem of data, ra data races. So any piece of data, has an invariant, has some state of validity that gets violated while it's being written. Because you don't know on the architecture you're dealing with how data gets laid out in memory. 
I mean, it could be cut, it could be happening character-wise, it could be happening bite-wise. But with the timing of asynchronicity, you never know whether somebody's going to try and read something that has not been completely written out yet. I'm sure you've all debugged problems that that ran into that case before. So your threads have to never observe a broken invariant. That's the basic policy. So co with concurrent reads, we don't have this problem because everybody is just seeing the same data. There's no, the, it, it has its invariant established. There's nothing, there's no broken state that we can observe. With a concurrent read or write, the write may or may not produce an invalid state for the object X, depending on when the readers see the data. And also with a single writer, this is okay because no thread's looking. So nobody sees that for a moment there, for some brief instant in time, that object becomes invalid. But once I have two people writing, well now I have a serious problem because who's going to get to that data first? And in fact, one may not even have completely finished writing to that memory location before the other one begins. So this is a data race. So the solution to all of this is your programs have to incorporate some type of thread safety. And we have two different types. Basic thread safety is essentially being as thread safe as an int. Which means that if you have something that's copyable, that you can copy around by value, nobody's ever really going to experience this problem with data race because they all have their own version of the data. That's your basic thread safety, but you can't do that for all objects. You can't do that for complex objects that are maintaining, like say a database handle or something like that. So then you need to provide the strong thread safety guarantee, which is that any single object can be read or written, if it supports writability, by any number of threads. So no matter how complex your code has gotten, how massively parallel it becomes, it is strongly thread safe if all of these threads will never ever experience any invariant condition. So shared mutable objects have to be strongly thread safe. So basic locking gives us an ability to create a moment in time where an invariant condition can occur that nobody else will see. So we create a lock and we associate it with some shared state. And this lock is owned by zero or more threads at any point in time. And by agreement, every thread will wait, if necessary, to acquire the ownership, and it will then release the ownership of the lock. This is all like threading 101. I'm sure none of this is a surprise to you. So now we, are, we have removed concurrent access to this variable, and we have serialized the access and made it, made it safe. So the standard talks about certain locking concepts. A basic lockable object, a, an object of type basic lockable, now this is not a type, I, I should say concept, not a type, but concept basic lockable, provides two methods, lock and unlock. That's it. That, that is a basic lockable thing. Um, lo the lockable concept requires basic lockable and adds a trilock method. Trilock returns a bool that, that indicates whether it successfully acquired the lock or not. So this is a non-blocking attempt to lock. And then timed lockable derives from lockable and gives you those two methods again, the, the for and until, for a duration or until a time point returning the same rule to say whether it actually succeeded in that time frame or not. So the mutex object provided by the standard is a minimal model of the lockable concept, meaning it provides lock, unlock, and trilock. And that's basically all it does. Plus, it gives you access to the native handle um, so that you can uh, interact with the operating system's version of that mutex. So let's implement a strongly thread safe, thread safe stack. Who hasn't implemented a strongly <laughs> thread safe stack like this? I mean, it's like, this is something you do in college course on threading. So we have a stack, but we're going to add a mutex into the stack. And all we're wanting to do is serialize access to the underlying thing. So we're going to have an empty method, which locks the mutex, checks whether it's empty, unlocks it. Top locks, checks the back, unlocks it. Typical pattern. We're making sure that whenever we're going to <coughs> access or do anything, we're locking and unlocking. But what if this throws? Well, we all know from Boost that we have a handy helper class to deal with that. We have lock guard in the standard as well. So LockGuard provides the resource acquisition and its initialization, or I always get that mixed up. It gives you the ability to scope a lock on a mutex. And now if v.back throws an exception, we will safely unlock it. So 
although you can use the lockable concept interface to lock a master direct and lock a mutex directly, it's much, much safer to use lock mode. So our implementation of pop, as you would expect, and push, just use a lock guard to do the typical operations on the vector. Now, if you need more flexibility than this, oh, and lock guard in its D structure will take ownership of a pre-locked mutex. <coughs> but there's no ownership release for this people. So you have to make sure. So if you, if you don't need, if you need something a little more than sh uh, the, the mutex lock, there is what uh, Dave has delightfully called the kitchen sink lock. It's called unique lock. And unique lock is sort of an, an analogous to unique pointer. So whereas unique pointer takes ownership of a pointer, and make sure that it gets destroyed when that unique pointer goes out of scope. Unique lock is sort of the same thing, but instead of destroying the thing that it owns, it unlocks it. So you, this implements the lock and unlock, it has the try lock, it has all the things that the time lockable implements. Plus you can get the underlying mutex. You can call release, so that you want somebody else to now take over this mutex. It's, it's very uh, similar in the interface to the way you would use get this logic, which is very similar to LockGuard. The way you use it is very similar to LockGuard. Um, if you pass this special little value, uh, this, this type here, if you adopt lock T, um, I don't know how you construct a value of that type. Uh, I think it's just adopt lock. Um, but if you pass that, it's just this bogus argument that, that causes that constructor to be called instead of the other one. It allows it to adopt a lock that you've already locked. So if you have a mutex and you locked it, but now you want <coughs> unique lock to cover the ownership of it, then you can pass it in and have it adopt that lock. So we can construct <coughs> without ownership a unique lock. So now we have put a mutex, either we create a unique lock that has no mutex associated, or we give it a mutex, but we say we don't want you to lock this the moment you are past the mutex the way that LockGuard does. We want to defer the locking until a point in time that I decide is more efficient. So you just pass a, a defer lock, a value of type defer lock to and we'll use that construct. And then we'll try locking, time locking, and then the accesses to and various utilities. So message passing. How do we pass messages between threads using this locking? So we want to use a bounded FIFO queue to pass messages between threads. Um, you're going to do basic threading tricks to avoid burning CPU by polling to lock to see if a message has arrived and lock to see if there's room in the queue for new messages. And how do you avoid sleeping if there's work that's available to be done. So the typical way of doing this is you have a broker mutex and some condition variables. So condition variables are the next thing that the standard gives us for working with locks. Uh, and they build up. They build on top of the mutexes, just like the boost condition variable does. So here's our bounded message queue. And what I do is I I get the lock. I, I lock that mutex. And then what I do is while this condition is not, while this condition is true, so I have nothing. There's nothing in the queue. I wait. I call not full, and that means I'm waiting for the buffer not to be full. I'm waiting for it to have some space in it for me to do work so I can put the value into the, into the, into the queue. And then when I'm done, I call, I use the not empty condition variable and I tell everybody, hey, this queue is no longer empty. So this is a very common recurring pattern that you see in these types of queues where you have one condition variable that's waiting on the condition of fullness and another condition variable that's waiting on the condition of emptiness. And so each side says, I'm waiting for there to be something so I can work, and the other guy is saying, I'm waiting for there to be space so I can do work and do something. Any questions on that? I mean, you'll find sample examples of this written for boost thread, written for any other thread architecture on the web. So here's the condition variable header. Uh, we have, we can notify one, we can notify all. We can get the data handle, again, it's a common method in all of these types. Um, we can wait on a specific unique lock. We can wait with a predicate, 
is that the only way that the predicate is true. We can wait until or wait for, again, those time-based methods. So there's a, there's a, what's nice is there's a certain harmony among all of these various types in C++11. A lot of the things you're going to do to these, these classes, a lot of the methods, they have analogs in all of the other related classes. So what the standard does not have is a shared meaning. So you cannot, which is one that can be acquired by multiple readers or by one writer. So that's where everybody who's waiting to read just piles in on this mutex, and then the one writer who gets it locks it and lets it go, but all the readers <coughs> won't cause the blocking lock. So this is something that you can get from the boost libraries until it gets into the standard. <coughs> and that is all. There is not all that much to be said. Um, so if anybody has any comments or questions, Um, maybe you, you answer this, but the function where you try until, is that a busy wait? Or, um... No, that's a time wait. So you're, you're letting a, you're going to try and, oh, you mean is it going to keep polling at a certain mm -hmm. interval? Yeah. It's going to call try lock. And however that's implemented by your operating system is going to define how, it's implemented, how, it, how it behaves. I mean, it, it all depends on what is more efficient for your, your platform. What's the current compiler support for this? I looked in live C++, and all the headers are complete as far as this support goes. I just haven't tried using it yet. <coughs> for uh, VC, it's VC11, like the methods. Yeah. Visual Studio 2012. Still really brand new. <laughs> uh, is there anything in futures for guaranteeing uh, the order of execution of the list of tasks that you send out? You mean uh, asyncs that you started? Yeah, you start a bunch of asyncs and some of them you want to be executed in the sequence. No, you will have to use mutexes to or establish to something like a entirely by yourself. Yeah, yeah, because it's going to be first come first serve in terms of who <coughs> gets the work done first. Right. I mean, some of those asyncs are going to turn, or depending on how many cores you have, some of those asyncs are even going to be serial. Right, some of them <coughs> parallel. But it, it's not the issue. I mean, some of them could be parallel, but you want to guarantee that at least some of them will be in the sequence that you created them. Yeah. So that's something you have to deal with entirely yourself. Sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Do you know why there is a version of two one shot? I do not know the specifics behind that, but. Um, I believe it has to do with movability because the asynchronous execution created an object which is potentially resource expensive. He has moved that object into the future and when you get from the future you are moving the object <coughs> out of the future. If you did it with a shared future you would be getting a shared state that other people might be looking at. So it is the cleanest and simplest solution to have something be moved all the way through but that requires that it be one shot. <coughs> So I was concerned about your uh, stack example. Um, were you just demonstrating how you could use a mutex, not suggesting that people actually write member function based locks? Because that's extremely unsafe. Yeah, and the other thing I forgot to mention about that class is it only really works if used in isolation. Because if you have a bigger batter class and it needs to do some type of invariant synchronization, you do not want it using a thread safe stack because then its outer level locks are going to be uh, make the inner level locks redundant. Well, e even just the stack itself, somebody could write code, if not empty, then pop. But the empty, yeah, that's thread safe, but then somebody who goes to <coughs> empty you and then you yeah. pop. And I see that as a common example. I was worried that they might interpret as good code. Yeah, sure well, right. that true. Total toy. This is a total toy. Yeah. None of the members were composable. You can't use them yeah. in combination and expect coherent behavior. Um, if you're interested in more about futures, Bartosz, who's the, the other speaker, right, one of the other speakers right now, he wrote a really good uh, blog article just two days ago on f futures and how their lack of composability in the current standard and ways that he sees of uh, improving them in the future. As it was an interesting read if you like this subject. The other thing is that uh, stacking Outside 
This one? The Q I either. No, it's fine. See the notify all? That's right. Um, I see lots of arguments on the internet as to which is, I, I think they both work, but which is better to do the notify inside the log as opposed to outside the log. Um, have any thoughts on that? Or? Well, it all depends on where the execution is in the other thread because they may not, they may be at a point in the, uh, in the while loop where they don't need that answer. I mean, if I call the not full outside, that means I've given the other threads a chance to execute between the time when I've left my, my little lock area and when I've called the notify all. And it may be that the other threads get a chance to do some extra work that they wouldn't have if they waited for me to call the notify all. But, you know, this is such a simplistic class that I don't really use a class like this too much, so I don't have a really ambitious opinion about that. The other thing that you get is that um, everyone's everyone's waiting on you know, something, and then you let go of the lock, everyone scrambles to get it again, and they end up waiting for the notify. And then you notify everyone. Everybody wakes up. <laughs> you got 10 threads. They all wake up. I think it's called the um, uh, stampeding bird or something like that. Term for that. They all wake up, and they all fight again yeah. for the lock, and one guy gets it. So you woke up ten thread for one to for one to wake up. Yeah. Well, there is there is a notify one uh, method here. Yeah. So if if the implementation of your <coughs> algorithm is aware of the fact that the stampeding herd would be severely detrimental to progress, you can just allow the operating system to randomly pick whichever next thread is going to execute, assuming it's random on that platform. That's all implementation defined. Did you have a slide that said if you call join on a non-joinable thread, it's going to throw. I mean, it's going to terminate. Yeah, it's going to terminate. Yeah, it seems like you I don't think that join throws. It's the future from the thread that will provide you with the uh, exception. Either the, either the asynchronous execution cannot leak a thread, or it provides you the exception information through a future. But join is not going to give you an exception. Yeah, I think you I did it. In some libraries, we have kind of unlock guard, which is pretty useful when you want to call a callback in the CRISPR session. You mean like inside your lock block? Yeah, you know, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. Part Just temporarily for an inside scope, I want to unlock. Sure, sure. Is there any similar or? No, not that I'm aware of. Anymore. I have to manually unlock and lock again. Oh. Yes? Are all the locks recursive locks or non-recursive or do you get fixed? That's a really good question. They, there are separate types. There's, there's, a, a, there's a recursive. Recaps, recursive recaps, yeah. time, right. time recursive. There you go. Because that'll, I mean, that'll help you know that. Kind of helps you know whether you can unlock it. If it's, if it's not recursive and you unlock it, you know that it's not locked. Sure. If it's recursive, you unlock it, you still don't know what it's taking. Yeah, uh, that's true. One of the, uh, the gotchas with condition variable that's not mentioned here is spurious wake ups on wait. Mm -hmm. Where if you wait, you could wake up and the condition's not yet satisfied. Uh, and your code correctly handles it by spinning on yes. the buffer, but it's not obvious to somebody who's just starting as soon as you just screw up. Yeah. Well, if you're one of the herd, that's usually going to be the case. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why the predicate form is so useful. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen, other peop I've seen people do interesting things with um, asynchronicity and futures as well in terms of call chain. Like if I have an operation that I want to be part of a pipeline, say I, have, say I have five steps, and each step can occur in parallel, but they need to be chained serially like you were saying before. They have it where they call, some, they call a function that uses async, gets the future, and then you call dot then on the object that it returns. And the dot then hands that future down to the next stage. And that stage creates another execu uh, asynchronous execution. And within that asynchronous um, function, it gets the value of the future. But meanwhile, it has returned a future which has been passed to the next chain on the then. So um, I've seen JavaScript code that uses this, this paradigm a lot, where you have this logic chaining, where every step in the chain can, might be happening parallel, but the futures allow you to serialize the, the value production. That's not standard yet, though, right? That's not standard. But you, you will, if you search for that, you will find some nifty little libraries we don't have that make use of the future facility to provide it. And, it. and it makes some forms of serialized 
it sounds funny to say, serialized parallel code, much, much easier to read. Because it's, more, it's a more natural expression of the flow of control. Um, if you've ever programmed in a lazy evaluation language like Haskell, under the hood, Haskell's using something like futures all over the place. Anytime you do any type of operation, it's not doing the operation, it's creating a package task and returning a future for it. And then later on down the line, when you need the value of that operation, <coughs> you're going to get the value of the future, which is going to cause that expression to evaluate, which then provides you with the lazy evaluation behavior. So you could write, say you were writing a spirit grammar, and you wanted the result, the action of that spirit grammar to be lazy evaluation, you can implement that quite easily. Actually, just a just a general comment. Um, so this is all, of course, you know, multi-threaded stuff, and and the standard is all nice and good, and it's wonderful and it's great. But um, I've hit the same problem that it is in every parallelized algorithm example, which is even on your own slide, where you go where you go. Well, if it's more than seven sixty-eight, I'll assume it's better to parallelize this. Yeah. If it's less. I'll assume it's not. Yeah. And that's totally a magic number. <laughs> yes. Yeah, unless you've done some sort of targeted profiling. But I mean, that, that's, not, that's really not a problem of the standard. That's a problem of the implementer. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just hoping someone will have a genius <coughs> idea on, 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 on. You mean auto resource balancing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are people working on that. Well, at least OpenMP tries with a dynamic scheduling. Uh -huh. But I guess that's as, as good as you can get. Yeah, it uses the dynamics, and it's got an if clause that tells you if you, so that you can tell it to to put in that magic number. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think if you PC know it, <laughs> and their and their and their looping structures, they have some way of doing that, and Intel Silk has some support for that, and therefore. Well, Silk gives you this benefit in that it's the serial equivalence means that you don't it, it manages all this the resource and the oversubscription. Maybe that's as, that's as close as what you might be referring to. I, I just want some I just want something that does the yeah that does the, the that finds out what's the magic number. I mean if I'm comparing you know if I'm sorting integers and comparing two ints is extremely fast. Yeah. If I'm comparing two objects two or objects that have some some, some kind of comparator, yeah. oh that's gonna be extremely slow at least compared yeah. compared to comparing integer. Yeah. In which case the seven sixty eight here is uh, 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 64 rather so silk might give you this promise right? okay that that it, it it knows how it knows about these things about resource usage and space allocations um, and, um, and and um, and it's all kind of hidden from you but you never actually like silk only has three words three keywords you can't actually tell it anything right <laughs> sorry yeah. and well even if you could come up with that magic number that's going to only be specific to a single platform and a, and a specific problem. Uh, I know, but just, just just like async, async is platform dependent implementation and figures at runtime what's best to do right now. Yeah, uh, you know which can be different from the next minute. Yeah. Uh, then again, I'm. You want more of that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Join the committee. If you're not there already. Does the basic red safety uh, qualification cover like, incorporation of some? Barrier. Basic thread safety is basically like in functional languages where everything's a value. Mm -hmm. So basic thread safety is like dealing with fundamental types. So you've got these objects that are being copied everywhere by values, so everyone has their own independent version of it. And so there can't be an, an invalid invariant by the time you receive that value. Yes? Yeah, the other way to look at that is that object is hiding a, a global behind it somewhere. Yeah, there's no, there's no mutable state. There's nothing that can happen to you in the time that you get the object. Like, um, that's, like consider the big illusion of const references, right? You get a const reference and you think, oh, I have this object that's not going to change. But you don't know whether there's any mutable instances in there, you don't know whether anyone's const casting it, you really have no guarantee that the state of that object from the moment you received it is the state of the object when you use it. Does it say anything about copies between threads or only just copies of the basic thread safety? 
Well, the basic thread safety is, um, yeah, that, that applies universally. I mean, you won't run into thread problems when you have basic thread safety. Depending on what you mean by yeah, well, true, so, true. I meant value, value yeah, so, related. So, at, at least the way I, I think about this, and I may, may not be thinking about it correctly, is a, the basic threat safety, the way I'm reading it, is that every object that you're, you're operating on that supports basic threat safety is in effect <coughs> atomic when it changes. So, if it's assuming that your processor has a 32-bit box and you're writing Aligned with that 32-bit box. When you write 32 bits, all 32 bits arrive at the same time. If you misalign those 32 bits, then 16 bits of them will arrive at one time, 16 bits will arrive at another time, and that integer itself will not comply with this, this model. That's not what that's not what you're saying. Yeah, that's not, so, that's so not, like I said, I can easily be confused. That's, 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 I, I can't be confused. fewer than how we can implement basic things. If, if uh, what, what I'm asking is, if you're going to copy an object between the threads, is there any other operation you have to do to make sure that copy is valid? C++ will make sure that the copy is finished by the time your thread sees the object, if you're doing a copy. If it's really a copy, you're not handing a reference to anything that's possible. I thought there was like a requirement to issue some call in fact, to the oh. text to make sure that no, and your question, if you want to get... You don't have to do that if you're just doing anything by value. The way you can get basic thread safety everywhere is just copy everything. Never pass references. Yeah, don't share anything. Yeah, yeah don't share don't sharing any value, so there's no, there's no sharing. Yeah, that's right. Never use shared pointer. Don't use, a, yeah. don't use pointers. Well, the basic thread safety guarantee is what's just provided by default if your reads are physically reads uh, and you don't have shared or global state. So like stick vector does not do anything special and yet it supports the basic thread safety guarantee. You only have to do special things if you really have shared under the covers like shared footer in order to support the basic thread safety guarantee. Um, its reads are physically writes because it's going to increment the ref count and different copies of an object can share a ref count. So it actually needs to protect that under the covers. But most objects you write will just automatically support the basic threads in here too. So it's not some strange thing. <coughs> yeah, really no. easy. No, and actually, if, if you if you watch the video of the other presentation on functional programming in C++, a lot of the things that they will talk about will give you the basic thread safety guarantee. That no, there's, there's no mutation. Yeah, there's no mutation. See, standard vector is a good example, right? Yeah. You have a vector in this in this thread. It's only in that thread. No one else is using it. The other thread's got another vector. So you can use a vector in a thread as long as it's not shared. And the, the guarantee is that standard vector doesn't have some static global in its implementation somewhere that's going to screw you. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And that it's reads are physically read. So you could have multiple threads copying from a single vector, and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if you wanted to use a global integer, just make sure that it never got changed after the threads were started. Then everybody can read it and that it's basic thread safety. Though they're sharing the same value, they are never, never running into this problem. Anything you find curious about that? No, if not, then we actually are ending early. Uh, we'll I didn't see any mention of like building the time types. I think that's something. Yes, I am not going to talk about that. So that's another presentation. Yeah, that's that's his present. Tomorrow. What time tomorrow? So before lunch, the last one before lunch, to find out about.